Thanks everyone for coming. So um, we had a little extra time, so I thought we could do a fun little demo of this. So I just made this up, so bear with me. Um, so I will need three volunteers from the crowd who are willing to crawl in front of the audience. Do I have any takers? Okay, that's one. Two more. Two. And I need a third. Someone to go on their, on their knees. Third, great. So if the three gentlemen could just stand over there. Okay, I'll explain why they have to crawl, unfortunately, because this was not planned, so Maybe crawling is my workaround. So, <laughs> so uh, this is like uh, a project I did with my six-year-old at home, and uh, it's a do-it-yourself snow globe, and, and in the talk we'll go into detail of, of how it's built and everything. But uh, I brought it with me. This is the actual globe I made with her. Uh, I brought it all the way from Bahrain, which is near Dubai, so flew across Europe to get here. And um, so now uh, there's a little kind of wire here, a conductive thread, and if you make physical contact with it, the alarm will go off. But the catch is it has to be with your skin. And I didn't want to walk around barefoot. So you guys will crawl, and once your hands contact this, the alarm should go off. So Whoever's going to go first, come by and let's see if this alarm system works. Just crawl on your hands and knees, oh and hopefully, when your hand touches this, the alarm will go off. Okay. So. <laughs> let's see if it works. <laughs> so he's the intruder. Oh, there we go. Detected. Very nice. Thank you. So who's next? Let's see if you can go undetected. Very sneaky little intruder here. Oh, he's going low. Oh, oh, but we got him. We got him. For my third volunteer. He's sneaky, this one. Oh, he saw the thread, didn't he? I've seen people do that. I've seen people do that. See, that's why I do this in the dark. We usually dim the lights, and then you can't see the thread. I don't know if you guys can see the thread, but it's like really thin, so. But maybe we should turn off the lights. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Then you guys won't <laughs> see anything. If, uh, we can pass the mic around if you guys have any questions about this for a few minutes before I start the actual uh, slide itself. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you're going to cover this in your talk, but I just wonder how it's powered. Some kind of a battery, rechargeable battery? Or? Yes. So uh, a lot of times when you have these portable things, power can be a bit of a headache. But uh, the computer that's used in this, what's great, is it just needs three AAA batteries. It's a regular uh, battery pack. And I, and I put it at the bottom because the first model you'll see was on the outside, and my daughter said, this is ugly, you have to fix it. So <laughs> I had to go and learn a little woodwork and build this whole case so that I could conceal the battery pack at the bottom. But it's basically running on uh, AAA batteries at the bottom that we can open up with some handy dandy Velcro. And that's the battery. So that makes it really easy. Like, there's no concern about recharging. I mean, you can use rechargeable batteries. Cool. Any other questions? Sorry, so the trigger is the... So there is this super thin conductive thread. This is just like thread that you'd have in your clothing, but it's made of stainless steel. And they have some funky manufacturing technique where it feels in as thin as regular thread. So I, you could use any wire, but I intentionally wanted to use this because it's so thin that you could kind of conceal it and carpet. And if you dim the lighting a little bit, people can't be so sneaky like that third little volunteer <laughs> and sneak by it. So that's what they were touching. Now, if you touch it with your shoes, it's not going to do anything because it's rubber, it won't conduct, but it has to do with your hands or your feet, bare feet. So how do you actually detect contact? What's the, what's, what are you actually measuring? Yeah, so basically it's a capacitive touch, uh, and it has a little capacitive touch sensor, on eight sensors on this computer, so I connect it to one of them. And you can attach any wire, anything that conducts electricity, and it just uh, detects changes in the resistance. So. Any other questions? We have five minutes of questions that you must ask. <laughs> <laughs> or I can go straight to the oh. 
This side? Yes. It's a very good question. <laughs> and it's funny you mention it because kids like you are very sneaky. And <laughs> so when I started, I had a very long thread. It was like five meters. And I was like, cool, they can put it everywhere. And then there's no escape. And then I found out that there's a limit to how much this capacitive touch can detect. It's not going to like detect something 10 meters away. So uh, generally, you can use 1.5 meters, uh, which turned out to be quite good because a lot of the doorways in our house. So we pick the spot where you can't walk around. So <laughs> that's how I solved that problem. It doesn't work everywhere. But, you know. okay. uh, if, you had a floor, uh, if you had a floor that was uh, conductive, would it still work? So that would be even better because this conductive thread, it's not super resistant. But if you look here, for example, these are metal, these pieces. And if it's something like metal, you can really get a great distance. If you, for example, this metal trimming here, right? Uh, I bet that could go a much greater distance. So it depends on the material. Um, but uh, with the conductive thread, because it's thread and everything, it's not a super good conductor. They, they also have this uh, thing called copper tape, uh, which conducts great, and then you can stick it up. But the problem with that stuff when we're doing it is it's very visible. So I had to match something that you could conceal and would conduct the electricity, which this is the compromise kind of thing. Sorry? Oh. Uh, that's a good question. I haven't tested it on mice. Could you <laughs> repeat the question? But, uh, yeah. So from what I'd seen in a lot of uh, the videos, so th this is a project I made from scratch, you know, with my kid. But the actual conductive thread is, is part of the computer. And they have tons of demos where they like plug into a potato, and then you can play music with a potato, or, uh, animals, all sorts of stuff. There's tons of stuff that can conduct. It doesn't have to be a perfect conductor that you could go and use. So you could make a fruit bowl, I guess, system that if someone touches an apple, goes wee woo wee woo and says, back off my apple. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot of options uh, in terms of what you could use for the capacitive touch. We can start the talk. If you Great. Want. Yeah. So then we will have more time for Q and A. You g will have 24 minutes of talk to figure out all your amazing questions. So let's begin formally. Please give it up for Marwan. Thank you. So uh, I'll go through the talk, and then we'll have another Q&A. Uh, I'm sure when you see the presentation, you'll have a lot of questions, because a lot of the technology I go through in detail. So this is a project I did with my uh, six-year-old. This is the six-year-old in question. And uh, basically, uh, you can buy these little do-it-yourself snow globes. You fill it with water, choose any dolly, put glitter, and, and then uh, there's a little computer in the base. And when we built it, and you'll see the code, it operates on two modes. One's called the rainbow mode, where it just goes and does circles of colors. And the other is the intruder alert system that I just demoed. The rainbow mode uh, is just for decoration. So you can just put it and marvel at the rainbow colors that come off of it. And the intruder alert is more for you know, setting up an intruder challenge. So I'll show both of the code and the rest of it. So now the structure of the talk will be uh, how does I assemble it, how you uh, put it together. The code, all the code that's involved, will go through it. And then the third bit is I use this as a platform to teach computing to my daughter. And she's six, so I had to keep that in mind when I was teaching her this. And, uh, but it turned out well, because uh, the hardware is actually quite designed for teaching and for kids and everything. And uh, uh, then what I did is I taught her uh, aspects about sound and light, kind of the physics of sound, frequency, and how visible light is red, green, and blue, and how that can be represented by using this uh, as a platform for that. So let's see uh, the assembly. This is the computer that was used. It's uh, running circuit Python, which is a fork of MicroPython. So this is a, a trimmed down version of Python that runs on bare metal on, on this kind of uh, limited uh, hardware or low-end hardware. It costs $25. And what I love about it is it has everything we need built it in. So I'd seen other projects that require soldering, and I didn't want to do anything that I couldn't do with my daughter. And a soldering iron, you have to be wary. So everything that was done here, I did with her. Um, so she really felt like she was part of it. And definitely, her personality went into it from choosing the doll to uh, 
to the way the wood was decorated and colored and the rest of it, which I think made it more fun for her. Now, the way you work with this device is it just has a USB connector, connect to the computer, it'll appear as a USB drive. There's one text file called main.py. Uh, you just edit it in the text editor of your choice, um, and then you can get the code set up on like that. So it was very quick and easy to get started and get immediate results, which made a big difference. This is one of many projects I attempted with her, and she has a certain amount of patience. She will tolerate a certain amount of wait time to get a Raspberry Pi connected and booted, and, and uh, so this was a great success with her. So I'll just compare it real quick to another popular platform, the Raspberry Pi, and the three things that really make this just great for me is it has all this I.O. built into it. Everything that was used, I didn't have to add. Um, like, it has the lights that does the green and red alarm and the rainbow and uh, the speakers and everything like that for the alarm. Compared to Raspberry Pi, where I would have had to get a breadboard, do wiring and the rest of it, and uh, she would have been more frustrated waiting. To it. And the other thing I'd say about it is when you turn it on, it turns on immediately, it runs your code. So Raspberry Pis, they take 30 seconds. And 30 seconds doesn't sound bad, but for a six-year-old, it's like, what's this thing doing? <laughs> That's 30 seconds of my life I'm never going to get back. I turned it on, it's not doing anything, right? Well, this, the moment you turn on the power, it immediately goes into play mode for the kids. The batteries are also a lot easier than Raspberry Pi because uh, they just support these AAA batteries that you can plug in and get going. So these are the components uh, that were used to build it. A snow globe kit, uh, that's a hollowed out base that this computer fits into. And uh, that's the computer, the AAA battery, and the conductor there. So these are the retail prices on Adafruit's website who sell all of this stuff. Some of this you can find on Amazon UK and elsewhere, like Circuit Playground Express. But the snow globe kit, I could only find it on their uh, original website, Adafruit. So this just gives you a sense of the pricing. That conductive thread, I only used 1.5 meters, but I don't know how long that roll is. Or whatever. So this is my attempt at doing an exploded view of the base, you know? So I was like, how do I levitate? So I got these crocodile clips, and then that's kind of just trying to show you how this gets assembled. And uh, essentially, you add water, glycerin, glitter, and dolly into the bottom bit. And uh, the glycerin just makes it thicker so that, you know, when you shake it as a snow globe, the glitter hangs out like slow more, snow more. So that's the dolly rammed in upside down, and you're going to have to glue her bottom so she doesn't. If you do not glue the dolly's bottom, as I did not, this is what happens. <laughs> so you don't want to be there. Because what do kids want to do with the snow globe? They want to shake it, right? You want the snow to move around. And then it's like, Baba, what's happening with the doll? Why is she upside down? That doesn't look cool anymore. So I had to go remove the whole thing and do it again. And uh, one thing I'd suggest is I used a glue gun to stick her t uh, to the bottom. And, and it worked really well. And the nice thing about using a glue gun is I'm scared to use super glue with my daughter. If I glue her hand to her face, her mom will be very annoyed with me. Well, you know, with a glue gun, generally it's, it's, it's safer to do it around the kid. And uh, I'd seen some of the guides online and don't follow them because it's a pain. They use regular glue and then the mom or dad is just waiting for like two hours for the glue to dry. And so with this, it like dries in 30 seconds, glue guns usually, so you, it's a quick process. Whoops, I skipped a slide back. Sorry. So this is the first attempt. And uh, uh, I'd seen an online guy say, just stick the battery to the bottom of the base. I did that. And then after I put it, it kept falling over. So then I stuck a piece of glue, uh, wood, so it wouldn't fall over. And I marveled at this. And my daughter said, this looks like garbage. <laughs> so I had to go back to the drawing board. And it's a very demanding six-year-old, and I just you know, wish to please. So then uh, what did I do? Uh, I built this wooden base with her. Again, I got her involved. This is just this balsa soft wood uh, that uh, I used and cut uh, to do that. So it's, it's two pieces, these two long pieces, and we just measured it out and made the base that way. And then I cut holes through the plastic, and that uh, originally, I, I, as you see in the old, earlier model, it's just a little hole that you could cut with anything, a hammer and a nail or a drill. But then uh, I made this more elaborate hole that could fit the whole battery holder through which helped me when I was bringing it to London on an airplane. And I didn't want them to be like, hey, this is very exciting. What is this? So I separated the computer and the battery and packed them separately, which you could do when you have it like this. And then uh, uh, 
a side aspect of using a wooden base is she had a blast like decorating and personalizing it and she's written her name uh, on it and dated it and kind of personalized it. So, um, Okay, so uh, the battery is quite straightforward. Uh, it's just a uh, uh, AAA batteries you put in. I glued a piece of Velcro to both sides because I don't like to permanently glue stuff that I want to remove. And that allowed me to remove the electronics and put it back uh, with that uh, Velcro. And I intentionally put it right in the middle of the base so that you know when you position it like this, no one sees the battery, which every kid, all her friends came and said, battery's ugly. I don't want to see the battery. So uh, this is the wiring, easy peasy. You just plug in uh, the battery. And then the conductive thread feels exactly like regular thread. So you can tie a knot just like you would with a regular thread. And it turns out two knots is more than enough to create enough of a connection for it to work. So this was a pleasure because I have done soldering before and I'm just not very good at it. So, uh, But I can definitely tie a knot. So uh, this just shows the thread coming out of it. Uh, I ended up with 1.3 meters, 1.5 meters, whatever is a sweet spot. Because uh, if you have it too short, you can't spread it long enough to cover a doorway. If you have it too long, uh, uh, it won't be able to detect people stepping on it and this specific thread. But like I mentioned, depending on the resource in defense. So uh, building is fun, definitely. And you know, mileage will vary between kids. It's, it's quite funny, I have two kids, one's nine and this one's six. And my older kid, she's not as much into this stuff, but this girl, you give her like a power tool and she won't stop. <laughs> so, um, so you know, your marriage mileage will vary. But definitely, I, I, what I find generally with my kids is you know, see where it takes you. you and, and when I started, I started really simple and I let her kind of drive it. And she really liked the idea of making the wooden base and cutting it and measuring it. And she spent ages with the ruler and everything doing it. So, so that's it for part one of the talk. Um, we'll go straight into the uh, code. So uh, the computer is running CircuitPython, which is, you know, fork of MicroPython. Like I mentioned, just plug in to the USB port of any Linux Windows Mac. And they basically implemented like a USB flash protocol, whatever, through you know, the computer. So when you connect it, you don't feel it. It's just like a, a drive that pops up with one file, main.py. Just open it, any text editor, save it. Every time you save the file, it's so smart, this thing. Because I'd worked with other MicroPython hardware, and this was like, wow, this guy's really went all out. Every time you save the file, it detects it, reboots the whole thing, and runs the new version. So you don't even have to do the usual of save and run. You just press save and it runs it, you know? Which is really useful because maybe not for my six-year-old, but let's say you're with a 12 or 14-year-old, they can just plug it in and, and see examples online, copy paste them, press save each time, and it runs. They don't have to figure out all this other software. Now, making this whole thing, I didn't need the REPL. And if you want to do this at home with anyone or at school, you don't need the REPL. But the REPL is definitely very useful because if you want to debug or work with it or teach, you can. And if you want a REPL, um, you need a little more software to help you. So if you're running Linux or Mac, screen is built in and you just write screen and the device name and the baud rate and then you have a REPL. Um, if you're on Windows or you want a GUI, you can use this new editor. It's a Python open source text editor that supports Adafruit out of the box, and you just press the REPL button, and you're set. So let's look a little bit at the built-in APIs that come out of the box with this, because this is what we'll be calling in the code. So just want to keep you guys familiar. One import statement, and everything is provided through that module uh, called CPX. And uh, so. Uh, when someone trips over the alarm, you heard the wee woo wee woo alarm, right? So that's just playing a high tone and a low tone, and that's how we'll pay like 800 gigahertz for half a second. Uh, you can control the brightness. Uh, you can set the colors of individual pixels. So it comes with 10 pixels in a circle. Um, or you can send this fill, which says set them all as one color, and we use both of these. Um, the rainbow wants to send individual. The alarm just wants to make everything green or everything red. And uh, then there are two inputs that we want to check for. The uh, switch, there's a physical toggle switch, 
and uh, depending on which side you toggle it, it will either do rainbow mode or it will do intruder alert. And uh, if we have time, I'll show the rainbow mode too and you'll see these beautiful little colors here. Yeah. So, uh, so we check for that and then finally, the main thing in the intruder alert is checking did someone touch that connection, the capacitive touch sensor. It comes with I think 10 or 13 touch pads and so you can do all sorts of stuff like a little touch piano with fruits and stuff like that. There's tons of guides for this doing it online. I just need one, so I randomly selected A2 pad and that's what I'll be checking for. And both of the switches, true or false, depending on if it's on or off. So uh, this is the main function and uh, we will see the other functions soon that it's calling. But uh, basically for readability, I didn't want to go and say set color to 25500. So I created these data structures, constants at the top, one is tones, these are the two tones I use, low and high. I just selected some tones that sound well, like for the siren. And then uh, these are the main colors that we'll be using. And then cycle, we'll just choose when we rainbow, we'll go from scion to blue to magenta to red. So that's the sequence we'll use, which I selected with my six-year-old. And she specifically said, no, 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 no. That color has to be before that color. So um, that's her personalized preference for rainbow. Uh, then uh, I'm frequently calling the CPX play tone with the frequency or whatever, so I made a helper function called beep that generally would be pi or low. And uh, so the main loop, so this, all the code is one file, main.py, and whatever you run it executes. You don't have to make a main function, but it's just how I code often. So main will call main, right? And uh, it sets the brightness to maximum, and then it will make a beep. That beep is very important. Don't underestimate it because I turned it on many times and nothing happens and I'm wondering, is my code running or not? So, you know, I always turn it on and wait for the little beep. And uh, it's instant, so I can show you. So that gives you a sense of how long it takes to just start to your code and it's essentially immediate, which is good. And then we go to an infinite loop and depending on which way you put the toggle switch, either call rainbow for the rainbow effect or detect to do the intruder alarm system. Okay, so this is what rainbow looks like. So essentially we go through those LEDs and we go and make them all red, then make them all green, then make them all blue. And uh, this is what it looks like in the dark. And you know when I did this, this is like a common example that they have or whatever. And I thought whatever, but my kids really love this. And what they did is they took it, went in the room, turned all the lights off, turned it on and sat in bed. And essentially what happens is these LEDs go through the whole globe and then they create this pattern on the ceiling which just rotates, which looks really cool. So um, it turned out to be something that they liked when they don't want to play intruder alert and they just want to put it to decorate their room. Uh, so that's the rainbow function at the bottom. Constants are the same. And essentially we loop through each color and then for that specific color we loop through each of the LEDs set the color, sleep for 300 milliseconds. When we don't sleep, it just goes whee, you don't notice anything. So we need to pause so human beings can perceive the change in color. Um, and uh, so that's the rainbow mode. This is the intruder alert system, which now you don't need a video since you've had three gentlemen give the crawl demonstration. But at home, usually we play this game barefoot and people don't crawl around, they just walk around. And um, so the distance turned out to be quite good because it's enough to fit any doorway or hallway. So they go and set the trap up and then they'd be like, mama, 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 you have to come to my room right now. <laughs> and then mom comes and they goes, wait, wait, wait. And like, what do you want? I'm busy. I don't know what these games are you're playing. So, um, but they really liked it because it was portable. They can turn on and off. It doesn't need any setup. Adult go away. I know how to play this game. I play it on my own, uh, which is always a plus. So let's look at the uh, intruder code detection system. So it's essentially two functions, it calls detect, and uh, this just keeps looking, looping and looking for uh, someone to step on the conductive thread. Now I want it to flip between, to be green and off, green and off, half a second green, half a second off, so it's like showing that I'm watching in green mode and then if you trip it, it goes red. So first, I did green, slept for five minutes a second and did black. And then I realized when I was stepping on it, it wasn't immediate. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, no surprise. I mean, I'm delaying for 500 milliseconds. So you need this to be really responsive or else it's frustrating because you're pressing and it's not striking the alarm. So essentially what this loop is, is I'm operating 20 frames per second. 
I see for 50 milliseconds, so I keep checking that sensor every uh, 20 times a second, which is more than enough to perceive humans as immediate. And uh, then I will show green for 10 milliseconds, so for 10 frames, and then off for 10 frames. So that's what it's doing, like 10 green, 10 off, 10 green, 10 off, and that's a full cycle. And then I just check, did someone step on the center or not? If they did, then call the alarm. And uh, the alarm does three red flashes, and uh, then it just goes between high or low. And when you do that, that's how you achieve the siren, like wee -woo, wee -woo, wee -woo. And those are the two tones, say 960 hertz and 800 hertz. I, I just, that's what felt natural. I know. And uh, so that's the end of the coding. The last part of this presentation, my friends, will be uh, the teaching aspect. This was very cool and surprising. I didn't expect it to uh, be so fruitful. So basically, I got my daughter. I said, I use Linux. Deal with it. There's no GUIs today. And I took my little terminal, made it full screen, full screen, ran the REPL, and said, we are going to control this computer. And I said, write one plus one. And she said, I can do that. And she did one plus one, enter, and two came out. And then she got the general gist of it. And I told her that, look, this is the REPL. Whatever you write, you're telling the computer to do, and that's the answer it gives you. You're having a conversation with this machine. Tell it what you want it to do. So then she was like, I know, 1,000 plus 1,000. And I was like, let's see what happens. <laughs> and we got 2,000, which she loved. And then she's like, I know how this thing works. And so we started off with math, which was good. And uh, then some aspects about doing this with the six-year-old. Because I, I taught many adults before uh, coding and programming, but not that much with kids. And uh, so she's six, right? So typing can be tiresome if she has to type a lot. So what she ended up using a lot is the command history, which is supported through the terminal and the REPL. So you'll see later when she runs beep, she would just, I tell you, you don't have to rewrite beep. You can just press up, and it goes to your history. So if you press up, enter, it will beep again. This, of course, turned into her going up, enter, up, enter, up, enter, up, enter, up, enter. And I was like, beep, 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 beep. And I was like, OK, you get it. Can we continue? It's like, I'm not done yet. Up, 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 enter. <laughs> so that's a very useful feature that we use all the time. But for kids, it's like a lifesaver. The other thing is I'll show you an API created to reduce the amount of typing she has to do. And then the last thing is, you know, I, I had this experience when I was a kid writing that print hello and then doing it 10,000 times that I figured it out. I'm doing it on my own. And once she figured out how to control the lights, she essentially pushed me aside and said, I'm going to make a rainbow. And she chose each color in each slide because she knew how to do it. So uh, generally, I, I think this is feasible you know, enough uh, where they can pick it up and then figure it out there. So, uh, and then we use this to learn about sound and light. So let's see some of this. So now I talked about the built-in APIs, which are very verbose and fine for adults. But for kids, it's a pain to write all of those funny characters, like square brackets and, and whatnot. So I tried to make it really simple. And so I wrote this little teach-like library. All of the code for all this project's on GitHub, and you'll see the links later. Uh, essentially, there's just two functions that she needs to call beep or LED. Beep for sound, LED to control the lights. And if she just writes beep, then it uses a default frequency. and, and uh, specific thing, but then she can write uh, a specific uh, frequency and choose, I want to do a low beep, a high beep. And that opened up the whole discussion of hearing range of humans and dogs, and, uh, and, and we'll see that shortly. And then when you are using this directly, these lights are super bright. They will blind you, you know? So you could control the brightness, very useful. So I just go in and set the brightness at 2%, and that's more than enough, and it doesn't blind me. So I recommend doing that when you do the session. Then LED. If you just call LED and you press enter, so I told her, write LED, you know, those little brackets that really ticked her off. She has to press shift zero and then shift nine. And, but once she figured it out, she was fine. Enter. Then the first light will turn white. Then I tell her, oh, press up again. And now instead, why don't you write red and one? And now you can set the second light, you know, as, as red or green or blue or whatever. And then in that way, she just used that, kept pressing up and changing the color names and doing that to set a specific arrangement that she wanted. Then I open it up a little bit and allow the color to either be one of these known names or hex code or uh, this little funny notation I made, ones and zeros computer style. So 
I intentionally decided not to put a hash in front of the hex code so that she would have less to type. When I taught her about sound, it very quickly turned into, I told her to put a high number and she couldn't hear. And I was like, yeah, we can't hear these really high frequencies of ultrasound. But uh, dogs can hear stuff that's higher than we can. So we Googled and we found this nice chart uh, showing these different animals in their hearing range. And she just loved this. And she was really curious about what? A dog can hear something we can't, but what can we hear that that animal can't? And you know, you know, where do we kick animal butt and where do they kick our butt in terms of hearing? So uh, then we moved on to light. And this was just a wonderful surprise. So I had this USB microscope laying around. It cost 30 pounds. I just bought on Amazon many years ago. And we look at all sorts of things from like little fruits, raspberries, to uh, all sorts of stuff. So it turns out that these NeoPixels are big enough that when you put this using this regular you know, consumer microscope, you can see the individual pixels, the red, green, and blue. And what was cool about this is this is a video. So I put it there. We're seeing a live feed of the colors. And I say, give me magenta. And it's only blue and red. And they're like, oh, cool. The green's off. And so when she would play with it, she felt in a very real sense that this idea that visible light can be represented as red, green, and blue isn't just some theoretical notion. I can physically see these three separate lights through the microscope, but then look and then see how they blend uh, at that level of magnification for a human. So I really recommend this exercise. It was good. Then I showed her a color wheel and said, this is a color wheel. I used the GIMP. It's a free uh, image editor. I said, choose any color. You have 16 million options. She loved all of those options. And at great length, she said, no, 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 no. I want this color. No, 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 no. I'm going to change the shade and everything like that. And then once she chose her color, finally, I told her, look at the red, green, and blue. So it seems that purple is very red and very blue and not so much green. And then uh, I just take that color, copy paste it, and put it on the circuit playground, and her head exploded. She's like, that's the color I chose. And I was like, exactly. Isn't that amazing? That is a unique representation of one of 16 million colors. And then she very much was like, I like this hex thing. I don't know what it means, but it's very useful to me. Many more colors are available to me now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, make hex useful, right? So this was also fun to do. So all this just happened after this. I grabbed her and I was like, hey, you want to learn some more? And she's like, sure, I don't have anything. And so it just turned into building on this. When she gets bored, she comes and says, let's do a project. So I throw stuff at her. And so what did I do? Uh, I, I printed this Venn diagram, red, green, and blue. And I said, these are the colors. And all these colors he knows about on the board. And you can tell him the colors, and, and, and it will go that way. And then this was an empty table. This, she filled the whole thing. And uh, what I did is I talked her through the first few colors. So I told her, remember the microscope. You know, computers, they don't know about on and off. They want to talk about ones and zeros because they're silly that way. And I told her, on is one and off is zero. That's all you have to memorize. And then she's like, on one, off zero, off zero. And I was like, yeah, you don't have to write on and off all the time. All we want is the zeros and ones. Stop writing on and off. <laughs> and she was insistent. But then she finally compromised and said, fine. I'll do it without the ons and offs. And so I made her fill all of that. Uh, and then she got yellow wrong. So I said, you're wrong. Yellow's messed up. And uh, so then I told her, I said, you know, uh, figure it out. And uh, she went in. And it was really nice as a Venn diagram because she could just visually trace it. It says, oh, yeah, yellow, green. Oh, yeah, it's red. And then she corrected it easily just by looking at that. So, uh, then after that, we said, let's do the hexes. Remember the hexes? Hexes are easy. Just one is FF000. So she just went like that. And she did a few of them. She got one wrong and corrected it. And then I said, now let's go back and tell him. Write, you know, uh, 110. See what happens. And it was yellow. And I was like, see? So basically, the lesson that she took out of this was that the same piece of information, like a color, can be represented in three completely different uh, ways. And it's almost arbitrary how you decide to take real world information and represent it computationally to a computer. The end. So now, uh, this is the, my personal website, one o that's an O, not a zero. And on it, you'll find the slide, the codes, the links to all the products and everything like that. And I open up to more questions and answers. Thank, Thank you. you very much.
so now, do we have more questions? Yeah, we do. Thank you for a brilliant, funny, inspiring um, talk. What's the next? Sorry, wait, where are you? Cool, sorry. <laughs> I was what's like, the, the uh, voice is coming here, you know? <laughs> <It's like laughs> what's the next um, techie project you got planned for? Oh, great question. So, musical paintings. Uh, it's all from this Adafruit website. They have really great products. They have this uh, electric ink at Conductive. So, we're going to make a painting. And depending on where you touch on the painting, there's a circuit playground stuck to the back of the canvas. And it will go and play music, um, pop songs like Havana, and I don't know what is their choice. But you, know, <laughs> you press on different parts of painting and do this. So that's our next planned project. 